So now, how do we use these concepts to actually manage interest rate risk in a portfolio? Well, the first thing we should recognize is that investors, but certainly financial institutions, are subject to substantial interest rate risk. Um, obviously, as an individual homeowner, you might have interest rate risk if you have an adjustable rate mortgage, uh, an ARM. But banks actually have substantial interest rate risk as well because they take as deposits fairly short-term uh, liabilities effectively. A bank is funded by deposits, but remember, a investor or I guess bank client may withdraw their deposits at any time. So the maturity of these deposits can be quite low, but at the same time, the bank usually lends for longer time horizons, uh, such as, you know, giving a mortgage loan or uh, a business loan. So that means that the duration of a bank's assets and a bank's liabilities might actually be different, and therefore its interest rate risk uh, could be substantial. And a pension fund, of course, faces interest rate risk because uh, they have a certain portfolio of bonds and they have to use the bonds, um, as well as maybe other assets, to fund down the road uh, substantial payments to retirees and therefore if changes in the interest rate uh, that assets in the market will actually offer uh, could actually drive substantial changes in uh, the assets versus the liabilities that the pension fund faces. Um, what types of interest rate risk are there? Well, there's, there's two. There's the price risk and reinvestment risk. Uh, price risk, we already sort of have a good handle on the idea that simply the present value of either an asset or a liability uh, will actually change if the discount rate changes. So the present value of a bond is going to go down if the discount rate goes up. But added to that, there's also reinvestment risk, which is to say that the cash flows produced by a bond um, will actually then be worth more or less or will earn more or less because they must be reinvested at a higher or lower rate depending on these changes in the prevailing interest rate at the time. So we would like to use this idea of duration to try to minimize both of these risks, uh, both price and reinvestment risk, um, to try to isolate ourselves from value changes introduced by changes in interest rates. So how can we do this? Well, if we have an ex uh, a formula for the price change of a bond with respect to changes in yield, and we know that we can use this formula to get the price changes for an entire portfolio, then let's actually apply it to make the duration of both the assets and the liabilities of our balance sheet equal. That will actually mean that we are no longer affected by changes in the interest rate, right? So let's say that we are a bank and we have some fixed income securities on our asset side and liability side of our balance sheet. If their durations are unequal, that means that the asset side fixed income securities will change differently from the liability side at fixed income securities given the same change in yields. And that, well, that might be good if our asset side fixed income securities go up more than those on the liability side. If let's say yields go down and the duration of our assets is greater than the duration of our liabilities. We'll simply represent the scale of the duration as the scale of the letter. So big D that means that the duration of the assets is greater than the duration of the liabilities. Well, if yields go down, that means that the price of our assets will go up, right? And in fact, it will go up more than the price of our liabilities 
because the duration of our assets is greater than the duration of our liabilities. And that's good, but what if yields go up, or sorry, yeah, yields go up instead? Well then, the price of our assets will actually go down, and it will go down by more than the price of our liabilities, which then actually means that our balance sheet surplus now turns into a deficit. And uh, I guess one of the fundamental ideas that we have from accounting is that if your assets are ever less than your liabilities, well, you're actually insolvent. And therefore, a bank with a big duration mismatch can actually lose big if yields do change unfavorably. In other words, if, if they go up. And if the duration of the assets is greater than the duration of the liability. Now, conversely, if we actually set the duration of the assets equal to the duration of the liabilities, then the total price change has the difference between uh, the price change in the assets and the price change in liabilities is actually going to be zero. Because no matter what the change in the yield is, if the duration is the same, then the price change of the assets is equal to the price change of the liabilities, and therefore the balance sheet is actually going to remain balanced. And this is what we call an immunized portfolio. In other words, one whose assets and liabilities will increase by or decrease by the same amount uh, for any given change in yields, therefore making it completely uh, unaffected by changes in yield. Which is to say, of course, both assets and liabilities prices will actually change. The overall magnitude of the balance sheet will change, but the difference between assets and liabilities will not. Now, why is this important? As the example of the bank that we alluded to just a little bit ago, um, this actually did turn out to be a big disruption to the financial system uh, back in the SNL crisis in the late 1980s. Um, so savings and loans institutions uh, essentially borrowed money at a low rate because usually uh, they borrowed short term. They lent out the same money at a larger rate um, they would lend it out maybe at a 6% rate. The reason they were able to do this is because they lent it out at long term, uh, maybe making like a mortgage loan. And with that very simple business model, they were able to uh, get out on the golf course by three o'clock because things essentially took care of themselves. Now, the problem is that this actually does result in a big duration mismatch, right? If you think about what your assets are, your assets are these mortgage loans. Your liabilities are short-term deposits. So we have exactly the situation that we sketched out previously. Long maturity fixed income assets have a large duration. Short maturity fixed uh, income liabilities will have a small duration. And therefore, if yields actually rise, then the present value of your loans will fall, the mortgage loans that you've given out as an SNL, will fall a lot. The present value of your short-term liabilities, your bank deposits, won't change a whole lot will fall only a little. And so now you have a savings and loan institution that has far less on the asset side of its balance sheet than it does on the liability side. In other words, it is insolvent. In other words, it is bankrupt. So this is why duration is really important for fixed income portfolio management, because it can literally cause the failure of a firm. So we know the cure for, for this. We know that if we mature, if we duration match, we should be able to avoid this problem. 
but let's actually look at a practical implication of this. Um, let's look at doing this on behalf of a pension fund. Let's say that we have a liability as a pension fund with a duration of about 15 years. In other words, the average uh, time at which we must make our payout is 15 years. And currently we have bonds in our portfolio that have a duration of about five years. So the problem is that we have a duration mismatch, right? The duration of our liabilities is actually greater than the duration of our assets. This is similar to, but a little bit different from what we saw in the previous case. Here now the duration of our liabilities is high, the duration of our assets is lower. So what happens if the interest rate falls? Well, remember, a fall in interest rates means an increase in the present values of a fixed income asset. And if this is linearly proportional to duration, that means that if interest rates fall, liabilities with a longer duration will increase by more than assets with a smaller duration. So here again, you have that same problem that this pension fund would effectively then be insolvent. It would be unable to make the payments uh, to GM's retirees simply because it would owe far more uh, than it actually has to pay out in assets. So this would be bad. Now, of course, the upside would be, well, what if interest rates actually fell? Uh, well, then the present value of the liabilities would go down by more than the present value of assets. This pension fund would be in surplus. Um, but that is probably not enough of an upside to offset the disaster that would happen if interest rates actually uh, do fall. And nobody really can predict interest rate changes with certainty. So as a prudent pension manager, you have to take into account this potentially serious shortfall. Why does this come about? Well, remember, there's this idea of price risk, and at the same time, there is also an effect of reinvestment risk. If interest rates are lower, assets can't necessarily be reinvested uh, at an attractive enough rate to make future payments. So how do we avoid this bad case of the world that will befall this pension fund with a greater duration of liabilities than a duration of assets if interest rates do fall. Well, the solution is, of course, we should immunize our portfolio. Um, indeed, we should try to create an asset side of this balance sheet that has the same duration as the liability side. How would we go about this? Well, first, I guess we got to figure out what our liabilities that we must fund actually are. So let's say that we need to make a payment to our retirees of 100 million in 15 years. Now the current market rate is 6%. We'll assume it's the same for all maturities, which is a bit of an assumption, and we'll see why this is important later. And let's say that right now we actually do have enough to fund these liabilities. In other words, the current uh, assets in the fund are exactly the present value of liabilities. And if our liabilities in 15 years are 100 million, then their present value at a 6% discount rate is 41.73 million. Now let's say that we have two, for the sake of simplicity, assets that we can actually keep in our portfolio, a one-year bond and a 30-year bond, both zero coupon. We can ask ourselves, well, first of all, what are the prices of these bonds? If we want to put them in our portfolio, how many should we buy? And now let's actually then consider the robustness of this portfolio to an interest rate change. Let's say that interest rates go up 
to 7% from 6%. They rise by 1%. Um, what would actually be the new value of the bond's assets and the bond's liabilities? Well, let's consider one potential scenario. Let's say that we, as the pension fund manager, decide to put everything in 30-year bonds. Well, the price of a 30-year bond today is going to be its face value. Remember, this is, these are zero-coupon bonds. They're going to be discounted at the current yield to maturity, which is 6%, and discounted for 30 years. The present value is 17.41. That means that if we fund the entire present value of our liabilities uh, from these 30-year uh, bonds, we need to buy 2.4 million of them because each bond has a present value of 17.41. Uh, we need to fund a portfolio with a present value of 41.73 million. Remember, that was the present value of our liabilities now. We need to buy 2.4 million. And then, of course, if the interest rate does stay at 6% in 15 years' time, these 2.4 million bonds with a price of 17.41 each will grow at 6% for 15 years to a present value of $1 million and we will be covered. But what would happen if interest rates actually rose to 7%? Well, remember there's a difference in uh, maturities, so therefore we should expect a difference in the present values of our bonds versus liabilities. We know in, the, in 15 years the, the value of our liabilities is still going to be 100. What's the price of our bond at a 7% discount rate in 30 years' time? Well, that's only going to be $13.14. So as interest rates rose, our bonds fell uh, from 17 to 13 dollars each. That means that now our portfolio is worth, we still have 2.4 million bonds in it, but each bond is only 13 dollars and 14 cents. So the whole portfolio is worth only 31.48 million dollars. Now offsetting that is of course the idea that we can now grow our portfolio assets at this higher prevailing interest rate so it's compounded forward by 7% for 15 years. But that still only gets us to 86.86 million. In other words, not enough to cover our liabilities of 100 million. This is exactly the bad outcome from interest rate increases that we wanted to avoid. And of course, the reason that we didn't avoid it is because we do have a duration mismatch, right? what is our duration of our assets. Well, if our assets are 30 years zero coupon bonds, the duration is 30. What is the duration of our liabilities? Well, it's 15, right? Because we have to make that one-time payment of 100 million in 15 years time. So that means that our assets change more than our liabilities do for a change in yields. And if our yields have gone up, that means that our assets will fall by more than our liabilities will, which is exactly what we have observed here, that we end up with fewer assets than liabilities. And therefore, we have a pension fund that cannot pay off its obligations. Now, what could we do differently? Well, let's say that we actually want to make the duration of our bond portfolio assets and liabilities equal to each other. Uh, that means that we need to have our asset portfolio have a duration of 15, because that's the duration of our liabilities, right? 
Well, if we can only allocate our assets to either a one year or 30 year zero coupon bond, well, that means that our duration is just going to be some weighting between 1 and 30, the respective durations of those two bonds. And if we solve this linear equation, we can actually see that we can get a asset duration of 15 by setting the weight of the one year zero coupons to about 51.7 percent of the total. That means that we need to fund 51.7 percent of our total uh, asset value of 41.7 million from zero uh, from one year zero coupons in other words 21.58 million the remainder must come from the 30 year zero coupons or 20.14 million that means that we need to buy 23 million in one year bonds and we need to buy 1.16 million in 30 year bonds because 94.34 is the price of a one year bond currently and we already worked out the price of a 30 year bond and if the interest rates stay at six percent of course we simply compound the value of the whole portfolio 15 years at six percent per year getting to our uh, future value that we need of 100 million but better still this portfolio will actually do okay if interest rates do go up uh, to 7% from 6% we can actually test this mathematically because remember now we have 0.23 million in one year bonds 1.16 million in 30 year bonds we know what their new prices are going to be with a 7% yield. The one-year bond is going to drop a bit. The 30-year bond is going to drop a lot. The holdings, the positions in both of these bonds are now going to decrease somewhat. The one-year bonds are now going to be worth in total because we had 0.23 million of them. They're going to be worth 21.38 million. The 30-year bonds are going to be worth 13.14 million each, and with 1.16 million of those, in total, they're going to be worth 15.2. And if this portfolio now grows at the prevailing interest rate of 7%, we can actually see that it will grow to a little bit over 100 million still. So we still manage to cover our liabilities. Um, so this is the power of uh, duration matching. Uh, let's actually work this out in Excel so that we are comfortable with the math and then we'll wrap up. Alright, so let's work out the immunization uh, solution for the pension fund in Excel. Uh, remember we've got a one-year zero coupon, a 30-year zero coupon. We know that their durations are of course going to be their maturities because that's what we should expect for zero coupon bonds by definition. Their prices are just going to be their discounted present values. Uh, remember, the yield starts at 6%. So the price of the one year zero is 94.33. The price of the 30 year zero is 17.4. Now let's first prove to ourselves that the proportion that we would need to hold in the one year zero is 0.51. That would let us duration match. Remember, we would get this by getting the algebraic solution to a linear equation in one variable and on the prior slide the answer was 0.51 let's just make sure that the duration of our assets would actually come out to be 15 and so 0.517 times the duration of the one year zero coupons plus 1 minus 0.517 times the duration of the 30 year zero coupons and indeed this is pretty much 15 which is of course the duration of our liabilities by definition because remember our uh, pension fund is supposed to make a payout of 100 million in 15 years 
So the future value of our liabilities is going to be 100 million in 15 years, definitely. And that means that at the current yield to maturity, its present value is 41.72. Now, if we were told that we have the present value of our liabilities in our asset side, in our portfolio, um, how much would we actually need to buy of each of these bonds? Well, first of all, how much money would we have to invest in each one? Well, if our portfolio is going to have to be 0.517 of, uh, in other words, 51.7% of our portfolio is going to have to be made up of one year zeros, that means that we're going to need 51.7% of 41.72. Now, let's round up that up to some. 0.27 million. We're going to need about 2.57 million in one year zeros, and that means that we need 1 minus 51.7%, or I guess about 48.3%. That needs to be made up of uh, 30 years zero. So how much money would we put into that? Well, 48.3% of the 41.72 million total value of our um, asset portfolio, that's going to be 20.15 million. Now how many bonds does that actually translate to? Well, if we spend 21.57 million on one year zero coupons, each of which is worth 94.33 million, how many one year zero coupons can we buy? Now let's actually make that in millions divided by the price of the zero coupon, the one year zero, it looks like we would need to buy about 228,000 one year zeros. How many 30 year zeros would we need to buy? Well, again, we have 20.15 million and each of those bonds costs $17.41. So how many would we need to buy? About 115.7, we can round that up to 116 million individual bonds. So if this is how much they're worth, and this is how much we actually have, what is the present value of our assets going to be? Well, we have 228,000 bonds. Each of them is worth 94.33. And we have a hundred, a million and 157,000. 30 year zeros, and each of those is worth 17.41 right now. So our assets are 41.72 million. Of course, that's what we should expect because that's what we set it to. Uh, but then what will our future value of those assets be? Um, let's actually now express this again in millions. So let's divide by one million, yeah, 41.72. So indeed, by construction, this portfolio in present value matches our present value of liabilities. And so if nothing changes with our interest rates, what's the future value gonna be? Well, it's gonna be present value compounded at 
one plus the yield for 15 years and lo and behold we indeed can make that hundred million dollar payment now let's actually see whether this duration matching worked out for us if the yield does change so let's say the yield goes from as we saw in the prior slides uh, six percent to seven percent Well, it looks like we're okay, but let's just make sure that we followed the math by which we turned out to be okay. Remember, these were just fixed numbers, so none of that changed. This is the initial amount of money that we spent on bonds. This is how many bonds we bought. But now, both the one year zero and the 30 year zero are actually worth less, right? Because now they're being discounted at a higher rate. So the one year zero is worth only 93.45. The 30 year zero is worth 13.13. I guess we can round that to 13.14. If we multiply those prices per bond by the number of bond contracts, that we initially bought, remember these didn't change, we still bought 228,000 of these one year zeros and about 1.16 million of the 30 year zeros. Now our present value of assets is actually lower, right? Because each bond is now less. However, now that we take this present value and we compound it forward at this higher interest rate, we actually see that um, not only can we satisfy the future value of our liabilities, we actually come out a little bit ahead, uh, presumably because you know we didn't quite perfectly match duration and there was some rounding error introduced, but the bottom line is we're certainly very uh, close to meeting our obligation. In fact, we're a bit on the safe side. Whereas had we just stayed invested in the 30-year bond, um, as we saw two slides ago, we'd be now in a deep deficit. So this is the power of duration matching. This is how you actually do the calculations in terms of what fractions of each type of bond you need to hold, how much money you need to spend on them, and therefore how many bonds you need to buy of each what then is your present value of assets and how it then changes even if your yield also changes. So immunization of a portfolio with duration matching sounds real good, right? Um, well, there's a couple big caveats. Uh, the, f the first one is that really it protects you from a one-time change in yields. So we calculated a case where yields went up by 1% just once and then they stayed there for the next uh, 14 years. Uh, now of course that's not realistic because yields change all the time. So really what that means is that you have to keep rebalancing your portfolio to keep duration matching um, after any change in yield. Now, furthermore, we implicitly assumed a flat term structure, right? Because we said that the yield for a one-year bond is the same as the yield for a 30-year bond, either 6% or 7%. So we assumed a parallel shift in yields. They went up the same amount for both a one-year bond and a 30-year bond. This one is more problematic uh, because realistically, as we saw in that plot of term structure changes from the Financial Times, uh, short-term rates generally will oscillate more than long-term rates. So we won't really get these parallel shifts. Um, and of course, this really will only protect us if we duration match from small interest rate changes. Uh, otherwise, we're going to need to match convexity as well. So portfolio hedging in real life with fixed income is going to be a bit more difficult than this, but this sort of sets you on the right path um, for the importance of interest rate sensitivity uh, in portfolio risk, uh, risk management. And you can 
learn more by considering these ideas of non-parallel shift uh, convexity in the future. Thanks for listening.